So it's a pleasure to have Mark over here. Um, he's visiting for two days today and tomorrow. Mark um, got his PhD in Durham somewhat recently, about a year or so ago. Yep. Um, working with Carlos Frank in the cosmological uh, simulations group there. That's um, for his PhD. He did some really interesting uh, novel simulations on um, substructure in dark matter halos uh, with uh, warm dark matter. This is technically a very difficult problem, and it's much more difficult than doing standard cold dark matter simulations, as you'll, I'm sure, discuss as part of his talk. Uh, so since he graduated um, from Durham, he, he moved on to do a postdoc at uh, the University of Amsterdam and Leiden University. And at Amsterdam, he's part of this uh, Grappa Institute which I forgot the acronym, but I know it means something to do with gravitational gravity and gravity and astroparticle physics Amsterdam. That's right. So all you need to know is it's it's a relatively new institute. You've got a lot of great people there. Uh, well, I think it's in Louis Can't Read. What's that? Louis Can't Read. I can't read. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm going to pay more attention to this. Uh, are, are, are these advertisements or what? Is this like Delta Airlines? Are, are you doing that as sponsored? sponsored? Yeah. And anyway, okay. Um, so that's where he is. Don't take my report and take his slides. So anyway, so he's, been, he's done some really cool work in the past couple of years, and that's what he's going to talk about right now. So thanks, Mark. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so I'm going to tell you about all the things I've been doing except for just collecting various logos for the people where my universities I work in, the institutes that I work in, the people that pay me, and the people whose computers I use all the time. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, work that I've been doing for the last year. You're going to see quite a lot of it is still um, uh, some slightly some way from coming to fruition. Um, mostly done with Gianfranco Bertone in Grappa, Alexei Boyarsky in Leida, and uh, Carlos Frank um, in Durham, and lots of other people uh, working with them. Uh, so the way I'm going to uh, do this talk, I'm going to spend quite a lot of time in talking about the theory of the universe, how this model is done in Trinidad Dark Matter. I'm going to talk about is interesting. Um, things that it gives you that you wouldn't get in cold that matter, <laughs> the way its model works. And then much more briefly, I'm going to discuss the various ways in which we're seeking to, on some occasions, test this model. In other occasions, not so much test as just um, put it there into some galaxy information models, see what comes out the other end, see how it compares to cold that matter, and whether it might give you a better match to various observations observations that people make compared to standard cold dark matter. I am also going to talk briefly about the 3.5 kV line if we get time. Uh, note, I am not an X-ray person, so if you have any particular questions about the way that this data is dealt with, then I can give you some email addresses. <laughs> that, that, that's not my, um, not my field. So, so I'm going to start with the theory. Okay, so there are lots of problems in particle physics that people don't understand, that we don't have a good concrete answer for, including baryogenesis, where there are more baryons than um, antibaryons, um, and also uh, what is dark matter, where does that come from, how do neutrinos get their mass when they oscillate. Uh, so one really nice suggestion uh, that's been uh, developed over the last 15 years um, slightly less than that is what's known as the neutrino minimal standard model. You take your standard model, which is all of, which is well, here for the fermions, all of the uh, gray points that you see here, and in addition to these, you have three sterile neutrinos. These would be right-handed neutrinos that have masses in the range, or two of them have masses in the range of GUV, would be very close together, and one of which would be KV. The GV ones are useful in that the, um, these are what facilitate the um, oscillations of active neutrinos. Um, they will be very short lived. However, as however this KV style neutrino, the uh, third or the first, depending on how you count them, that's very stable. Not, in, not completely stable, but stable with a lifetime of over the age of the universe. And this could be a really nice dark matter candidate. And so this is what I'm going to spend all my time thinking about. 
And this is the particle that could potentially decay into X-rays that you might then see through an RKB line. Um, Quick, quickly before you go on, so you've got a, a KEV neutrino dark matter candidate. Right? Are you allowing for other candidates to, to try to deal with the galaxy formation because it, it appears to be cold, or are you assuming there's one and only one? So for this talk, I'm assuming that 100% of the dark matter is the KV star neutrino, if that's what you mean. So I'm not assuming, well, maybe it's partially KV or maybe it's partial and partially neutrinos or anything like that. I'm assuming that all dark matter is in the KV scale, in this KV star neutrino, which may or may not count as cold dark matter, depending on your definition of cold, as we'll see coming up. Um, so from the perspective of producing this stuff as dark matter, you've got uh, at least three um, possible ways of producing it, which is really quite relevant for the uh, types of galaxies, the number of galaxies you're going to get out at the end. Um, there's non-resonant resonance and decay of heavy scalars. Non-resonance is the simplest case you can think of, where in the early universe each of my active neutrinos, neutrinos we know about, has a finite probability of oscillating into a KV star neutrino. Um, the resonant case, which is much more complicated, whereby in the presence of electronic symmetry, which can be generated by the interaction of the two GV star neutrinos, you're able to increase the number of stellar neutrinos produced below a certain uh, momentum. So that is, the active neutrinos that we started with will have a boosted chance of turning into sterile neutrinos if they have a very if um, they have a low momentum. And this is really quite important what we're going to do. This is going to make the dark matter cooler or warmer, depending on the actual values of the parameters. And finally, some people looked into the decay of heavy scalar particles in the universe to create star neutrinos. Um, there's a discussion of this in um, paper by Alex Will and Arl Schneider, and I'm not going to talk about that anymore today, so I'm mostly going to just focus on, on the resonant. And I guess also slightly on the non-resonant as well, just in case where it's left on his symmetry is zero. Um, so here's, uh, here's a plot that say, some, I was trying to draw for a few people over lunch today, uh, just showing how this is really nice um, model that's got a closed parameter space. So here I've got the mass of this KV star neutrino along the bottom, and the mixing angle on the uh, left on the left axis here. Um, so in the simplest case you can think of, which is where there's no lepton asymmetry, you can do a calculation and show that to get the right abundance of dark matter, you have a one-to-one -one relationship between star neutrino mass and this mixing angle, which is this line here marked by the NRP. Okay? And it's been known for quite a while that actually this is ruled out, partially by the X-ray constraints. So the probability that your sterile neutrino dark matter is going to decay into um, uh, it's going to decay into X-rays that we may or may not have detected is related to um, the mass of the particle and the theta, which is why uh, you get this diagonal line here. So for most values of the mass, so above say 3 kV, the non-resonance is ruled out by non-observation, non-detection in x-rays. And if you were to look at this region here, you'll probably find that actually you've not got, um, actually you probably won't say generate enough satellite galaxies. For those of you who are familiar with warm dark matter. This, this is too warm, um, probably. But in this presence of this lepton asymmetry, which is going to boost the number of substructures, and so going to boost the number of um, uh, uh, star neutrinos, you can effectively have a smaller theta 1. So you've got this trade-off going on between these lepton asymmetries, which is shown here as these tracks, which are increasing as they go down here, as the theta one is decreasing. So you, well, why the lepton asymmetry would uh, increase the substructure? Increase sorry, the sorry, not increase the substructure, sorry. Um, uh, so 
Uh, if you were to keep the theta one constant, if you then increase the lepton asymmetry, then you uh, will boost the amount of stellar neutrinos that you get in total, which will mean that you get the wrong abundance. So here you've got a trade-off between increasing L6, this lepton asymmetry parameter, and uh, decreasing theta one in order to get the right amount of dark matter. Uh, up to a maximum L6 of 700, beyond which uh, it's actually not possible to get enough dark matter down here. So this is the region where you have too much dark matter, this is the region where you have not enough. Uh, so we've got this really nice parameter space that we can try and um, uh, that we can uh, bound from all sides. And particularly if you can get a good enough X-ray telescope, you can imagine moving this curve down and down and down until you actually rule out the entire parameter space or detect something. Okay, now I'm going to talk a little bit about the um, uh, way that resonant production works and also how this is going to be relevant for galaxy formation that we're going to uh, discuss. So I've got it here in a so I've got it here in a plot of momentum and this is just a normalized version of the number of uh, uh, it's just a distribution function. I've got this in a movie which is rather easy to understand if this still works. Um, is it gone? Um, here it is. Okay, so what I've got for you here, here this is a distribution function again for the 7 kV star neutrino, which is uh, topical, and just some very low value of this parameter L6. Um, and this is the distribution function that you get for these particles in the uh, early universe. And you can see it's got this really this shape that's rather like a Fermi Dirac, which is what you expect, because you're just taking these active neutrinos which have a Fermi Dirac distribution, turning some proportion of them into um, stellar neutrinos as a proportion well, in a way that's independent of Q, independent of the momentum. And so this is a rescale Fermi Dirac. But as I, in, what I'm going to do in this movie is I'm going to increase the value of this parameter L6, and you're going to see how it's going to have a very dramatic effect on the power spectrum particularly for certain values of making, of giving you far more, skewing this distribution far more towards cooler um, distribution functions, um, which would be very, very relevant for galaxy information. Okay, so if I just play this on for a little bit, you can see how to begin with not a lot is happening up here. You can see this starting to get this bump, okay? So this is the resonance. For very low values of the momentum, the, um, uh, still the acting neutrinos see this, see this um, uh, lepton asymmetry, and that boosts the production of stellar neutrinos initially at very small values of momentum. So you've got this peak over here. And you can also see that at this end, compared to the red dash curve, which is where we started, um, the amplitude has gone down slightly because I need to keep the same uh, total number of same total abundance of um, stellar neutrinos here. As I play it forward, you can see this effect continuing. So you've got a whole series of little bumps here, depending on what the uh, what the plasma is doing in the universe. And this peak here, where the resonance started. You might have noticed this has actually moved from the left hand side to the right hand side. So you've got some very complicated behavior going on here. And what you're actually going to find is when I run this all the way to the end, this region will have run all the way to cover all values of Q. And then that means that again each of these uh, each of the active neutrinos will have had an equal probability of being turned into a sterile neutrino. And you actually get the same answer that we started with. So I just let this play on through to the end. You can see you've got this, this big peak up here, up to an L6 of about eight, and then you settle back to where you were. So this is really quite 
unusual model with this non-monotonic behavior. So if you give me something with a very small L6, I can tell you that it's going to look a bit like Fermi Dirac. If it's a very large L6, it'll look a bit like Fermi Dirac. If it's somewhere in the middle, then you'll get some something that's much more skewed to lower values of Q. Something that's much more skewed. Temperature. Um, I think it's a, this all occurs around a temperature of a few hundred MeV. But again, this is I, I'm an, I'm a I'm a simple lowly astronomer. I grow up counting dark matter halos. This this is all stuff that I'm busy branching out into. The uh, simple answer to your question is I'm not sure. I think it's around about a few hundred TV that this happens. Okay, so. What I'd like to do now is directly. MEV or TEV? You said TEV in the past. You said MEV the first time. I think MEV is right. Yeah, I, I, I tried to say MEV. Um, so what I want to do now is take this and instead make the link to um, uh, two galaxy formation simulations. To do this, you need to know what the universe looks like at high redshift. Um, before any of your substructures, substructures have collapsed. So you can take, you can use something like CMB FAST or CAM or CLASS, uh, one of these Boltzmann solver codes, to take one of these um, distribution functions that I showed you, solve the Boltzmann equations um, to determine what the initial conditions of the universe should look like at redshift, say, 127. And then we can put that into our simulation and run it forward to uh, redshift zero, and we can count dark matter subhalos, or we can count galaxies and look at their structure. So again, I've got one of these pretty plots, which again I can show you in a in a movie. The matter power spectrum. So I'm going to take the um, take all of the uh, distribution functions that I showed you put them through this uh, modified version of CAM and see what the matter power spectrum you get out is. So this is just telling you how much power you've got on a scale K, where um, larger K corresponds to small scales, and this is multiplied by uh, this K cubed factor, which is really nice and it shows you where you've got a peak for the warm matter models. So in standard cold dark matter, you get the black curve, which comes all the way up here, and in practice would come several decades over this way and then be cut off at an earth mass or something. Very small scales, that's what you get for neutralino. Um, in the past, people have been interested in thermal relic warm dark matter, motivated more by astronomy rather than particle physics. Um, they come up with several lines of interest, so this dotted line is what's known as a 1.5 kV thermal relic. You always have to be careful comparing thermal relic masses to stellar neutrino masses, as I'll show you now, um, which is quite popular for Lyman alpha constraints maybe five years ago. Uh, here you've got a dashed line, which is the uh, which is a generic 2 kV thermal relic, which is what people like to use to try and to get the right number of satellite galaxies without having to invoke baryons and also to solve things like the 2 meter pale problem. And then up here you've got the dot dashed curve which represents the 3.3 kV two sigma limit that Matteo Beal came out with for his Lyman alpha work. Although Alexei Boyarsky back in that line will uh, express some misgivings about this curve. So the, uh, all, for all this, uh, you assume that there is oscillation going on between these uh, normal neutrinos and the Um Only for the Blue star neutrino curve that I'm going to show you. So blue is a star. Yeah, so in the blue is a star neutrino. These, these three dotted and dashed lines, those are nothing in particular. That, that's, just, that's just a toy model. And the blue is our star neutrino model. But those are thermal relic neutrino models. They're like assuming that the dark matter is some neutrino that was thermally well, it, it's, it's some I thermal see. particle. Yeah. So it's not necessarily neutrino at all. It's, Something's produced thermally in the universe that had a mass of order 
of um, 1.52 or something for kV. So what you can see here for our um, 7 kV. Wait, wait a minute. Are you saying it's being produced thermally, or is it? It, it sounded like it was only being produced through oscillation. Yeah. So that's a good one. So yeah. So so okay. the the blue cut, so the stone the blue stone neutrino is only produced through oscillations, and the toy model dot dashed are only produced thermally. All right. What are you assuming about your annihilation cross sections between the thermal the the, the sterile neutrinos? Where are you well, just the sterile neutrinos don't annihilate at all. Not with each other. No, they, they just decay. They just decay, so they can just oscillate back. Yes, um, but with a much smaller. Well, so that, that's actually what the three and a half kV line stuff is about. That in the late universe they can oscillate back into active neutrinos and X-ray photons. But uh, the process is much rarer because uh, the oscillation is actually enhanced at higher temperatures, if I remember correctly. So here we've got the, two, the 7 kV star neutrino for this arbitrary low uh, lapsoid symmetry. And what you see is that it sits very close to the 2 kV thermal curve. But due to the effect that I showed you with the uh, power, uh, with the distribution functions earlier, when I start increasing this L6, uh, because the distribution function is cooler, you're going to get less free streaming, you're going to have more power on small scales. So this blue curve is going to move up to touch the 3.3 kV curve, which is entirely serendipitous. It was not picked to do that. And then it's going to fall back again such that you end up back where you started. And you get some oscillations up here that I don't fully understand at the moment. That's just the Boltzmann curve doing something strange. So you see them getting closer and closer up so far, and then fall back again. <coughs> so if you come to me and say, well, no, I don't want the apps at all. Do we? That one. OK. And so then you get, at the end, you get something that looks like this, which is back where you started, which is really quite, which is really quite weird. Something I think it's worth taking a little bit of time to explain to people. Um, okay. Scroll down now. I'm going really quite quickly through this, actually. I'll tell us the fourth time giving this talk. So now I'm going to talk about uh, some applications of this. So taking, so partially taking the power spectra that you've seen, um, the thermal relic in some cases, the sterile neutrino in other cases, uh, just depending on what we haven't had available at the time, and comparing that to what you expect for CDM, and occasionally comparing it to what you see in observations. So we're going to start off with counting satellite galaxies. Um, so, one of the most interesting constraints on generic warm dark matter is the number of satellite galaxies around the Milky Way. Because uh, you can imagine that if you have a dark matter model that's really warm, you have a lot of free streaming in the early universe, you uh, erase the perturbations that would create, um, or that would create um, these um, small satellite galaxies and then they don't form. So some of you might have heard of the cold dark matter um, satellite problem. In, the, in cold dark matter, you generate thousands, tens of thousands of satellites, which is far more than what we observe. Well, in this case, we are looking at the alternative of that, which is where your dark matter is so warm you don't produce enough, okay? So given a particular halo mass you have for the Milky Way, um, you can as shown in this work done by Rachel Kennedy, you can try and make a guess as to what you expect the number of satellites is going to be for a given halo mass. Could be include baryons in And in this case, assuming baryons. So this is purely semi-analytic modeling. For those of you who are familiar with extended flash actor um, work. So here you're able to generate statistically large numbers of but take a halo mass and generate a large number of merger trees um, for that halo, which you can then apply a galaxy formation model to and 
fundamentally you can count the number of uh, satellite galaxies that you get and compare it to the number that we think are out there. So for example, here if you assume the Milky Way halo mass, where for those of you who are interested, the definition of halo mass here is actually M top hat, which is known as M100, um, with a 2 kV thermal relic now. So not a stellar neutrino, a generic toy model of 2 kV thermal relic. Um, with 8 times 10 to the, uh, since the 11 to the mass halo, you get this red curve here. You do lots of different realizations of this halo, and you can uh, then generate a, a, a statistical, um, well, it's not an uncertainty, what's the word I'm trying to think of. Um, so you've got to get a distribution of the possible number of satellites. Um, and so here you can see you get somewhere somewhere over to maybe 20 or so. And then as I increase the halo mass from 8 to um, 1.4, so 0.8 to 1.4 to 2.5 times 10 to 12, the number of satellites that I get increases because I've got less, because I've got a, because I've got a larger halo. Larger halos will have more substructures which can host more galaxies. But then on the other hand, if you were to go to the 20 kV, then the number of sub, and because you've got less of this free streaming, you have a large number of um, uh, halos are preserved, which means, which means that you get uh, more satellite galaxies at virtue zero. Uh, here, the dots are an extrapolation of what you expect the number of satellites to be uh, from assuming from the uh, data release five. Um, data from the SDSS, and by assuming that, and this is a slightly uh, unusual assumption, to, it's a very simple assumption to make, and probably not quite correct, which is that um, the satellites are just equally distributed on the sky. And then you get this curve, you see for the 2 kV, you find you need a 2.5 times 10 to the 12 kilo, and for the 20 kV, a um, a 1.4 will do the job for you. So you've got this degeneracy between the mass of the particle and also the mass of the Milky Way halo. So what we're now going to do is couple this together with um, what I've shown you about still neutrinos and update this um, for what happens uh, when we move from the thermal relic case to the sterile neutrino case. So the way this plot works on the y, on the x-axis, I've got the sterile neutrino mass, and on the y-axis, I've got the minimum halo mass required in order to give you enough uh, satellite galaxies uh, for for a given value to occur. So here I've got this Lepsin symmetry again. So if you were to just take a look at the red curve here, the 700, which is the war, which gives you the warmest value warmest power spectrum, free given value of the mass, and you get a curve that's right here, okay? So what this is telling you is that in order to get the number of satellites that we expect based on this extrapolation of the <coughs> data is five, if you've got a 10 kV star on Arduino, it needs to be your halo mass to be at least 1.9, whereas if you think the halo mass is actually, if you think the particle's actually um, three kV, then you need five times 10 to the 12, which is huge. Uh, in reality, we expect that, um, if I draw this on here, we expect, well, roughly speaking, that the halo mass ought to be, by this definition, at least two times, no more than two times 10 to the 12 solar masses. And so then you can see all of the selections of curves here, that's telling you what bits of the parameter space are still allowed. Uh, so if you're interested in particularly the 7 kV star neutrino that you get from the 3.5 kV line, then um, by comparing these curves here with this line, you expect, roughly speaking, um, your leptonic symmetry symmetries to be in the range 4 to 25, because if you've got something that's too low or too high, then you fall into the exclusion region. Uh, as a word of caution, this is all bound up with the uh, galaxy formation model, so if you think that um, things like supernova feedback and uh, 
um, the effects of reionization are going to remove gas more readily from the satellites than you thought, then the answer will change. So you shouldn't look at this and think this is a really strong statistical limit on these two parameters, uh, on the mass and on L6. It's more of a really quite useful guideline for what, what uh, values you think you, can, you are allowed and which are probably no good to you. So SMH is zero if it's not allowed by any means Sorry, what's it zero? Which would SMH is zero? Would the SMH is zero line is which one or is the black one, so it's down here. So it's if it's a seven K V neutrino, then you're saying that that's a hot it's a seven K V neutrino. Yeah, so seven K V that means if I take this three point five K V nine. Yep. From here, then that's a zero case in the heart. Yes, that's very hard to do. In, in practice, the asymmetry zero is actually ruled out by the X, by previous X-ray non-detections. You remember the plot I showed you earlier, where you had this, where I showed you stellar neutrino mass versus mixing angle, and you had my like, had this big red X-ray line, X-ray exclusion region that would sit on top of the um, L6 equals zero line. In fact, any L6 smaller than 8 is ruled out for 7 kV. Sorry, I'm going to ask the mass of the Milky Way question. Okay. So, so this M top hat, which is, when you said M100, that's the mass within 100 kilocortex? Yes. So it's is the... Because that, that seems pretty big for the mass of 100 Um. Well, typically people tend to talk about M200 rather than M100. And that's most probably between uh, 1 times 10 to the 12 and maybe 1.8 times 10 to the 12, probably yeah. lower. So I can't remember exactly how you go reliably from, well, this is my M200 to this is my M100. So that's okay. Okay, I'm sorry, M100 is actually measured within 100 kilocalories. For the Milky Way? Uh, or is it 100 times critical density? Uh, oh, um, yeah, that's, yeah. This, this well, is what's te yeah. Technically, okay. it's something that's so, uh, it's, it's regularly described as M, it's defined as M top hat, which is the radius that, the radius, something, to, uh, this is the sort of thing that Carlos will probably get me about. The, uh, something to do with the condition that you need for the halo to decouple and collapse, um, which uh, when you, uh, when people first did this calculation with WMAP1 data, perhaps a little bit earlier, um, this happened to occur at 100 times the 100 times the critical density of the universe. It got known as M100. Yes. Now that we know something a bit better about the actual cosmological parameters, it's now M97 or something. <laughs> so it's better to say on top hat. But 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 like in physical units, that's probably like somewhere around 300 kilocalories. Yes, around about around about there. Yes. Yes, yeah, so for the halos that I play with, M200 is typically at 240 kiloparsecs, and M50, which is also not really 50, it's probably about 47, is at 450 kiloparsecs. And this will be somewhere in between. Okay, but we don't want to uh, stick with just doing these. Um, uh, hey, don't want to we're just doing um, uh, the simulatic models. We quite like to do actual simulations as well, because then you can learn something about the distribution of these halos. So here's some work, just two slides on some work that's being done in Durham at the moment that I've had a big hand in. Of, um, I don't know, the COCO simulation stands for Copernicus Complexio, because it was developed by this um, Polish chap, Wojtek Helwing. Uh, so it's a big zoom simulation of um, some patch of space that's got 60 Milky Way analog halos in it. Uh, the resolutions, I can't remember precisely what it is, somewhere around the 10 to 5 solar mass is a bit lower than that. You're the uh, simulation dark matter particle, which for those of you who don't know, it's, uh, it's a conglomeration of 10 to the 60 odd of these dark matter particles, whether it's neutralinos or stellar neutrinos, we don't care for this case. It's just all lots of these 
minute particles stuck together and um, they consider them as one. And then we map seven cosmology and we ran it twice, uh, once with uh, cold dark matter and another with uh, generic warm dark matter, this 3.3 kV thermal relic that I spoke to you about before. And then you can do some very simple things with this. I say I'm an astronomer, I do simple things, I just count things. This is work that's been done by Sam McBose, who's uh, now a second year student in Durham. And so first off, just count the number of halos that you expect, uh, number of independent halos, um, that's the number of the function of halo mass, M200 in this case. Uh, in cold dark matter, you've got this blue curve here, where you've got quite a few of these halos at masses around 10 to the 9. Whereas in the cleaned warmed up matter, which is the red, then you even at 10 to the 9, you start to see this suppression. So you expect, and this is where we expect dwarf galaxies to form. So even in this 3.3 um, keV model, which is the one that's in many ways quite a good approximation to the coolest sterile neutrino model that we expect, you still expect to see. A, um, a decrease in the number of halos here, which is really quite nice. So hopefully, if we have, a, if we trust our galaxy formation models, the ability to do the simulation as well, then you can do simulations with the seven kV sterile neutrino, and hopefully get an answer that's different to cold dark matter. If you're particularly interested in the green <coughs> bump, well, that's what I actually did spend most of my uh, PhD worrying about these issues that. Um, um, Louis was mentioning earlier, this is just numerical noise that I've spent three years of my life trying to work out how to remove the payload catalogs. So we see here, so we've seen here that the number of objects decreases, as you would expect. And here just plot the concentrations. So this is showing you how concentrated halos are. Um, well, it's showing you the, relate, the mean relation between the concentration of halos on the y-axis and their mass on the x-axis. In cold dark matter, you've got these lines, uh, which is showing you a familiar relation in cold dark matter, which is a series of different redshifts. In respect from cold dark matter, you've got um, less massive objects being less, um, being more concentrated. Whereas in the warm dark matter, because of effects to do with fewer substructures, which collapse later when the universe is less dense, um, you get this tail off. And for those some point, the halos become not as concentrated as you would expect in cold dark matter. And again, if you can do your galaxy formation well, you should expect to be able to see this um, in your galaxy simulations and then compare it to um, observations. Do you, do you have an algorithm for getting rid of those brace halos, or are you just kind of eyeball it? Just kind of, I just kind of eyeball it. Yeah, I, so I, it would have taken me a lot sailing. more than three years if I'd just been eyeballing all of it. No, no, <laughs> no, yes, no, 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 no. Um, yeah, so there's uh, all the gory details in level 2014. Um, so what you find with these spurious things is that they form from filaments. Um, you can do, you can make, you can eyeball them in the initial conditions. Uh, before they collapse, you can take the particles, see where they were in the initial conditions, and see how they form these flat disks along the length of these filaments. And then you can do some geometry on that and generate some statistics that you can do a cut. Uh, that and there's a mass cut in there as well. But yes, uh, I'm more than happy to talk to people about that later, bring a sleeping bag and a good read. Um, so I said I wanted to put uh, baryonic physics in here, so that's what I'm going to do. Uh, here's a slide about uh, what's the, the Eagle project, just run by uh, Yop Shai and Leiden with uh, a whole lot of extra pluses here. This has been uh, three, four years of work for over ten people, <coughs> trying to get a really good galaxy formation model that's comprehensive, includes everything we think we know about cosmology, um, using Planck here, and how star formation works. Um, we tried to calibrate it to the, well, they tried to calibrate it to the, third, to the red chip point one luminosity function, which it does a decent job of. And then we try and get your predictive power from the simulation for various other observations. Um, 
them with two different sets of resolutions that I'm going to show you, one which is standard, where the particle mass, gas particle mass is 1.8 times 10 to the 6, and high resolution, which is 2.26 times 10 to the 5. Um, my purpose is, again, I'm just going to use the uh, 3.3 kb thermal relic time model, um, which is, say, a good approximation to what the uh, star neutrino might do in a series of these quite small 12 and a half megaparsec boxes. So the uh, statistics here are not going to be so great. The first thing you can do, again, is count things. So this is just counting the dark matter halos. Um, in the warm dark matter, 3.3 kV, which is the red, and black is the cold. Uh, I've shown the high resolution is the uh, thick lines, and the low resolution is the thin. Uh, so you can see here where in the thin you start to lose resolution and the number of objects drops off, and similarly in the um, uh, high resolution here. Uh, pretty well resolved, and it's a point where you can see that you've got this suppression in the number of uh, structures in warm dark matter, warm dark matter relative to cold, which is consistent with what we saw before. Um, the next thing that I was really quite excited to do was actually go and count some galaxies in the simulation since I had to spend my uh, PhD just counting dark matter halos. So to count things with stars in is really quite exciting. Um, here the noise is really quite difficult. This is just a differential plot of the number of substructures as a function of stellar mass. And here you've got some hints that you're seeing the number of warm dark matter um, galaxies being suppressed relative to cold. The statistics are not so great down here, so one thing we really want to do now is uh, take the ratio out. If you take the ratio out, you can just about to see that this is suppressed by a factor of 0.8 or so for the warm relative to the cold, but for this minor fluctuation here. Uh, so, so, that's so then you, so you have. So here you can manage to observe the luminosity function or observe number density, right? Yes. So when you manage that, do you match with CDM or WDM? It's matched with CDM. Um, by taking some parameters that are in the model and tweaking them to get as close to as you can. With the warmed up matter, we do not do any extra calibration. We just use the cold dark matter values. But if you were to do the warmed up matter again, it would probably be another three years of work for a lot of people. I don't want to do that, and I don't want to make them do that either, I'm nice. Um, so yes, this, this is calibrated, and it's calibrated the cold dark matter. And so it's just the simplest thing, put the warmed up matter in and see what happens. But yes, if you were trying to do this really thoroughly, you may well try to tune into the warmed up matter instead. Uh, perhaps more interesting, even more interesting still, is what happens with the star formation uh, rate. Um, so this is just telling you the. What's that we got? Uh, five minutes. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I've, I've got my own watch here, but I, I'm not the one with the power. That's very good. Where's your office? Yeah, so I, I, I'm on British time. I, I, I actually it's think that it's. Uh, <laughs> I actually think that it's ten to nine in the evening. I right? Which is even worse. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, so here I'm just effectively counting the density of stars. Uh, the good thing is just the number of stars in the universe, the function of redshift. Um, if you look at this in cold matter, which is this grey line here. Just about to see, uh, which is it go. It's a uh, struggle slightly to go through the observations, which are all various colour symbols, um, both at the at the high redshift end. You get a lot of star formation in cold dark matter, more than you perhaps expect, and at the low at the low redshift end, you get slightly less. As if you've gone and used up all of your gas quite early in the early in the universe, then you haven't got it to turn into stars later. But when you use the walnut matter, which is this um, darker gray line, you get less star formation at high redshift because structure forms later. You also get a little bit more at low redshift as well, which gets you closer to the observations, though um, trying to do 
low redshift is much harder than trying to do high redshift. Because at high redshift, that's, just, that's largely down to when the structures start to collapse, which doesn't really have so much to do with the um, star, with the, uh, star formation physics. Whereas down here, exactly how you implement the star formation is much more important. Um, again, with this sort of thing, you get quite a lot of noise. And so we want to uh, try and do some bigger boxes to try and improve uh, the statistics. Are those high rates of points agreed upon? No? Yeah. Because he can see the, I mean, yeah, no. OK. I mean, the years are probably going to take like two or three, even owing to systematic systematics. So we're not even sure that that drops as precipitously as what you're showing. Uh, as, in this year, year, yeah. as in whether you just not detected the stuff that's a, yeah, wasn't there like dust issues in there? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Systematics is a factor of two or three level. It's not the lead. That's a high risk. Right. Um, so you got more freedom? Yes. Unfortunately, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> yes. Uh, give, me a, give me all the freedom that you, that you can, and I'll, I'll enjoy it. Um, but also, this so one dark matter, did you assume you have to sterilize the neutrino model, like with oscillations or without oscillations? Because you also have freedom there, like uh, choosing different kinds of asymmetry. Yes, yeah, yeah. so, so for now, this is this is all oh, nothing to do with the sterile neutrino physics. This, this, just the this, is, this is just the thermal, thermal. thermal relic. But if you want to think about it in terms <coughs> of the um, sterile neutrino model that I showed you, it would be consistent with the uh, coolest of those. So if you were to instead make the model, so if you were to change the stellar neutrino model in any way, or actually put in, put, if you were to put in any of the stellar neutrino models, the effects would be more extreme than what you see here. So this gray curve would move to even lower redshifts. Um, so I've got this uh, increase up here. You can see this in individual galaxies. This is plotting the uh, specific star formation rates as a function of halo mass. And you can see that the red walnut matter points all have higher, uh, at this high mass range, all have higher um, star formation rates than in the cold dark matter um, galaxies. But then again, this might be due to um, small number of statistics and exactly how um, you implement the star formation. So th this is a bit more uncertain. Uh, so yes, um, this one. Uh, my favorite topic, or not, a brief history. I don't know how much people have been looking through the various arguments for and against a dark matter interpretation of 3.5 kV line, but I'm going to um, i just give you a history of all of the papers that have come out since February on this, um, with a cameo from Louis at the end. Well, a reference. Uh, so, for those of you who are not familiar, um, Bulbo et al, quite a few months ago, uh, um, stacked some clusters and found an excess at 3.5 keV in multiple instruments, said that this was well approximated by line, and said that this could well be decay of a three and a half of a seven kV star neutrino. And this result was also found by uh, Boyarsky and collaborators in uh, the Perseus cluster and also in M31. And what they claim is a, actually quite a good agreement between um, having a, uh, and what they say was a good agreement between uh, the observations and the dark matter interpretation. Um, some of the people looked at this and said, well, what should we think we're not so sure about this? So Rima Sorensen had a look and said, well, we've had a look at Chandra and didn't see anything. There's a group of people who uh, took some dwarf royal data, which should have lower background, and didn't see anything. Um, and that's not a lot of time. This 15 megaseconds of galaxy data is a bit more interesting for non-detection. And then the Elsman Profuma <coughs> Um, actually, they did find evidence of the line next to data of the galactic center, which they described as something other than dark matter, so drugs past acid and chlorine. And they had a look at the M31 work that was done by Boyarsky and said, we don't think that this is real. Um, 
uh, and Boyarsky published. So we, we found it in the galactic center as well, and we think that it is actually dark matter. And then you had two comments on the Yeltsin and Profuma stuff saying that they were incorrect, but not stuck with that. Um, Yeltsin and Profuma then got their student to write a student to write a paper on which they looked at the morphology of the claim signal, saying it was not consistent with dark matter, and then responded with a comment on the comments from these two people saying, no, we think that the comment, we comment that the comments here are not right. And then there's this paper that Louis is a member of that had a look with the Suzaku telescope, uh, found a signal in Perseus and not in three other galaxies, not in three other galaxy clusters, although they claim that Perseus detection is not consistent with dark matter. Uh, so my little bit, I um, simulated decay, uh, what a of time is about, um, of this using Big pretty simulations like this. Uh, so put simply, you take a um, you take an observer, put him at eight kiloparsecs from the main halo, from the centre of this dark matter halo that's simulated. Um, just count the number of objects, the number of dark matter particles that you see, and uh, treat them as point sources of X-rays. And do this for multiple different observers, and then you can get a distribution. Um, of likely fluxes from the Milky Way. Uh, you can also do this for uh, dwarf royals like Draco and Sculptor. By sitting at the same position and rather than looking at the center of the halo, you instead look at uh, various sub halos at the appropriate distance. And again, for M31, do the same thing just by taking the same observer and moving the uh, the other halo factor 100 away. Skip that. This is my penultimate slide. Uh, so this is just showing you for the projected mass that you expect from the Milky Way, our uh, M31, based on some of the uh, simulated halos that we've got. Um, so you've got a range of projected masses. If you then assume a decay lifetime for the particle, this tau 27, which is 10 27 seconds, then you can calculate what the flux ought to be from that target. And and compare that to the observations. So this is the de claim detection in the galactic center, the claim detection at 31, and the limit below the two signal exclusion from a black sky data set. And you can see that um, for a value of tau 27 between six and 10, you can get good agreement between M31 and the galactic center. So roughly through here. Um, we're also interested in looking at um, the uh, Draco Dwarf Galaxy, see if we can find a line there, because you've got a large amount of dark matter and very little um, background, which is given by the orange lines here, just to see. The horizontal line here, the dot dash, shows you what we expect, what we would expect it to have measured from Draco given current observations, which is not a lot. You expect to have only detected um, Draco down to, what's this, 6 times 10 to the 6 counts per second centimeter squared, which is above our expectation from the simulations, which is the orange here. But if we get the 1.3 megaseconds that we've asked for, maximum, then we should be able to get down to 1 times 10 to the minus 6, and then do better than, and then be able to detect anything that has 9 uh, decay lifetime of nine times over 27 or fewer. And I've already gone three minutes over, so I will stop there. Thank you. <coughs> So that depends on, in, in the simulations, having accurate, uh, you know, stellar light to dark matter mass uh, ratios right. for those low mass halos. Um, do we have any independent constraints on that ratio? I mean, are the models making accurate predictions? I'm thinking in particular of dynamics. We can get dynamical mass estimates for dwarf galaxies above some mass limit. And have you compared that? Um, I think that's what other people in the room are doing at the moment. 
So you need, you need to ask these two that question. So, yeah. so, so basically you're asking, um, okay, so these models predict that a halo of mass blah has you know, blah of many stars in at some level. And then you ask, if we actually go out and take galaxies with this luminosity, do they have that mass? Yeah. And the answer is, it's not clear uh, what, you know, it's not clear how to do that mapping yet. It appears, so the, the too big to fail problem, which he mentioned basically, was, is, it's a variation of the issue in the sense that in the standard cold dark matter model, uh, for a given luminosity of a halo, the observed dark matter halos are less massive than they're predicted to be. Okay, so, 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 so the problem is, you, there's, there's looming more extremely massive halos floating around. Okay, so, um, yeah, so, so basically now, okay, so that game is decently well played for cold dark matter. We're now just starting to play that game, and that's something that you're starting to do as well. Uh, with the uh, alternative simulations to see how these actually line up with the predictions much better. So the answer is, you know, in the scales in which we can accurately do the stellar kinematics, stay tuned. <laughs> right. uh, yes, yeah, so it's not clear. There's been some hints actually. Were you on that initial paper that um, that Carlos and friends wrote? Actually, you were first one. Yeah, it's claiming that the initial warm dark matter, the initial the broad results from warm dark matter basically solve the two big fail problem. Yeah. Yeah. So, but that's in the so, but that's in the luminosity. That's just in the luminosity function. That has nothing to do with how you measure um, me the measure masses of the dark matter halos. Yeah. No, I understand. Right. But the question is that then do I really uh, move forward this idea of one dark matter anymore? Because if I leave very long, then I don't need. Oh. The, yeah. That's, the <coughs> that's why. For a time we've been, we've been saying we are interested in sterile yeah. neutrino dark matter rather than warm dark matter because as people like Arts and Works will tell you, if you, you've got a, a, a disagreement between uh, dark matter only simulations and observations, you can solve it with baryons probably. Yeah. So instead is to say, well, if we think we know what the sterile neutrino parameters are, so if you've got the three half kV line and you think you can, you can get the mass quite easy just by saying, well, I see the line at three and a half kV. It's a two-body decay, therefore the mass is seven. And given the flux of the line, you can work out what the mixing angle ought to be. And from this plot, as you are drawn here, you can show what you think the L6 ought to be. No, no, I see that. It's actually small. Actually, when you say look at the X-ray. Line it should be more like here. No, I see your point that you want to make a prediction in this direction. But also, you have an assumption that it's a thermal map. If I take it to non thermal, would all these predictions be changed? Like, even with stereo So, the way I'm postulating into it. No, so if I take you back here, can I just say, the particle physics of what you're describing is that you've got a sterile neutrino decaying into two photons? Uh, no. Into one X-ray photon and an active neutrino for the X-ray line. That's how the Milky universe. So, so you're, all right, so the, the sterile neutrino is giving you a, a photon and a standard model neutrino? Yes. That would change your production mechanism. But it's not going to be in thermal equilibrium because you're not going to be producing these things. Because you're not going to be producing these things directly. They are only going to exist in the universe through oscillations from the production of the standard model neutrinos. In the early in the early, in the early universe. universe because you have the plasma and you're, you know, you're right. acting with Right. So the point is you've got lots of regular neutrinos being created all the time, but as the universe evolves, you have those regular neutrinos evolving into these sterile neutrinos. But they're not in thermal equilibrium. They're just no, no, no. They're, they're, they're created in the early universe. They're, 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 cre they're created in the early universe, and they kind of freeze out. Why would they be created? What's creating them? Oh, they're they're interacting with the plasma, right? So this through these through these matter induced resonances, right? So so neutrinos. Uh, oh, because you've got enough neutrinos and photons to interact. And, and uh, you know baryons, electrons, etc. 
but I doubt that there's no coupling between these guys. It's an oscillation. Okay, oscillation. It's, a, it's, it's basically, it's, it's effectively the MSW effect in the sun. You're, you're changing flavors right, due, due to matter and due right, because the density right. is so high. And there's a, you, you hit a matter induced resonance. Mass like it's day and then flavor like it's day. It's exactly that business. You're hitting a matter induced resonance in the universe. Once, once you're changing it, flavors. In this case, you're changing drops. That, once the mass density drops, the oscillation. So yeah, once the mass density right. drops, then you kind of just freeze out. Right. So, so the until you muscle. decay away. Until you start so, decaying away. So what kind of this assumption are we making about the lifetime of this thing? No. So it's ten to the twenty. 20 yeah. It's like much larger than the old universe, but like some tail of ever decaying. You know, if if they're all the dark matter and they have a lifetime ten to the twenty eight seconds or whatever, then just you know some some fraction are randomly decaying right it's now. The idea that these are these are the only form of dark matter is a different that they're different types. This is sort of a higher component of the I came in late, so maybe talking about this. It was really the assumption that these stone neutrinos are the dark matter part. So, in everything that I've assumed here, yeah, stone neutrinos are dark matter, so no neutralinos or anything. Yeah, so they can't decay very rapidly, or. No, they're all dark. Yeah, yeah, it's just like some tiny, tiny, yeah. tiny fraction of really decay. Yeah, and that's what you're seeing. Yeah, today. So, you see a super long time once they have to be for all these features? Well, for, for the purposes of my work, so going between thermal and non thermal, is between the dot dash curve here and the blue curve there. Between my um, thermal toy model, don't care what the particle is, you can call it Bob if you want to. Um, this is the actual oscillation. How do I understand this this dot dash part, part to be a long time? So this is just from some particle that has nothing to do with oscillation. It's okay, nothing so to do with dropping the oscillation. Yes, yeah, so completely dropping that all together. Right. Just something is produced firmly in the. It had a Fermi Dirac yeah, distribution. So it had some mass. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it, it can't be, you know, some part. Yeah, I think what, one of these things I think he's trying to highlight in this figure is that there's lots of degeneracies. You can mimic a, a non thermal curve with a thermal curve, and vice versa. So, um, you know, in addition to that, on top of that, then you have baryons, which are processing yes. that power spectrum. So, so this gets to be, this gets to be you know, pretty messy pretty quickly. Right. Um, but I think, yeah. Let's make a little comment, but there is, in sort of an astronomical context, a way don't miss any of these whole objects. These are called globular clusters. Now, globular clusters don't have dark matter halos. But if you don't have resolution, so they're really slow, they're really small. How do you know that you can't strip away the baryons from very small dark matter halos from globular clusters? Globular clusters don't give you remnants of what the, the missing sunlight so this was a This was an idea that was back in the 1980s when the North Galaxy was first discovered. And the fact that you see globular clusters form in tidal Galaxies sort of indicates that's really how they form. But has this this idea ever been really fit to us? Um, well, I've not heard of anybody talking about it further. No, uh, it's not come up in any discussions that I've had. It's not been close to rest as far as I know. I think that the, the party line is that the globular clusters have the wrong spatial distribution relative to the predicted satellite subhalos and CDM simulations. The globular clusters are sort of more centrally concentrated in the galaxy. It's very plausible you can come up with models in which they form within halos, but you have to sort of properly select which population. That That's what I'm saying that the models are correct in the universe is wrong. So, um, uh, in, 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 in an inverted sense, I mean, we know what the globular cluster population is. We, we have too much information about the right. size. But if you add the globular cluster population to the number of galaxies, you don't have thousands, but you do have hundreds. Yeah, yeah, that's right. right. Yeah. And it was just an idea a long time ago that just seems to have been ignored or has been put to rest. I, I don't actually think it's been put to rest at this stage. I think it's not. Um, yeah, I, I think I think the, the key thing is here is just it's trying to trying to understand why the globular clusters um, select these subhalos that are now much more centrally concentrated uh, and coming up with a model to do that. It's not impossible to do. I think Ben Moore and Grant set up a paper maybe seven or eight years ago. But you also removed the areas from the dark matter halo because the globular cluster don't have dark matter. 
Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. That's right. Yeah, I didn't mean to do that. I'm just saying this whole yeah. thing. Yeah. Then, then you can also talk about high velocity clouds, right? <laughs> because we don't yeah. know what to make of these things yet. So. Okay, so uh, actually, I'm going to go first. So maybe we'll just uh, stop the follow questions now. And Mark's around for today and tomorrow. I'm going to talk to him. He's at 516. So, so thanks a lot, Mark. This was a really great talk. Thank you. Thank you.